Okay, I'm gonna ask, ask our next panelist to come on up. We have Scott Gordon, who is the managing partner at CLA, Clifton Larson Allen. We have Paul Walzer, who is chairman of Walzer Automotive Group and former NADA chairman. We have Rob Cochran, who is the president and CEO at number one Cochran Automotive out of the Pittsburgh area. And we have Carl Schmidt, who is the founder and chairman of Hello Automotive Group. Thank you, Ellen, and good morning. I'm Scott Gordon, and I'm uh, a dealership principal with Clifton Larson Allen out of the Minneapolis office. And today we're going we're gonna to talk about the dealership group of the future and, and kind of what it looks like. You know, this is a topic we've been talking to a lot of our dealers about uh, over the course of the last five, six, seven years as the industry has really changed. We've probably talked about uh, this topic as much as we've talked about the tax implications of LIFO over the course of the last couple of years here, as LIFO has become a bigger issue for dealers. Uh, but today we've got a great panel. Uh, we've got a broad geography. We've got uh, Paul in Syracuse, uh, Rob in Pittsburgh, Carl out of uh, Minneapolis, and, and Paul out of Southern California. And so, but you know, when you, when you look at the industry and the significant changes happening, you look at the new competitors coming into the space, you know, I was listening to the Tesla conference call yesterday, and they're talking about producing a million eight vehicles in 2023. You know, basically from zero four or five years ago to a million eight today. You've got uh, Rivian, you got Lucid, you got different competitors uh, coming into the market, and so that's something that you're looking looking at. And then also just the the uh, the the EV revolution. Which is, you know, which is impacting all of us and how that plays out. Significant change uh, in, the, in the business. And then on top of it, you've got all the technologies that are impacting dealers that you're, you're really looking at, you're really investing in. You know, if you haven't spent some time uh, looking at the new, one of the newest AI uh, technologies coming, chat uh, GPT, we spent some time talking about it last night. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be revolutionary in the business. And so there's a lot of things impacting dealers today, our dealer clients. But when you look at it, it's probably never been a better time to be a dealer. Went through COVID, you know, it looked a little tough when we were going through COVID, but it's, it's really a good time to be a dealer. And so we're gonna spend the next hour uh, exploring what the dealership group of the future looks like. We've got a great panel. And so with that, we'll jump in here. You know, what I, what I thought we'd do to start off is, is the dealers, maybe we'll start with uh, Carl here, and, uh, and just talk a little bit about the, over the course of the next, uh, the course of the next five years, uh, two or three things that you're really uh, focused on as you look at building out your dealership group of the future. Am I on? Okay, great. Yep. So, uh, I guess when we can, we're a small group. I mean, I've had experience working for larger groups and growing and thinking about a lot of the things that Alan discussed earlier. So, I mean, from our point of view and the way we look at things, we have our for concern and we try to you know, mitigate you know potential loss in the future. We look at you know how we're going to scale. Um, Alan's point on there's not really economies of scale. We've found that to be difficult. But I look ahead and you know what's the impact of the physical costs that we have in terms of facility costs, manufacturers don't seem to be loosening their pressure on uh, having big expanded facilities. <clears throat> How do we mitigate that? I think Alan's point on uh, you know getting into the DR space really completely and being able to have, in our world, we have a smaller, smaller stores in kind of second tier markets, but being able to leverage those facilities and keep them busy if I had the capability and the capacity and the systems to be able to sell pre-owned into, you know, we're, we're in LA, in the LA market, there's 17 million people within 100 miles of the store. If we had the ability to capture that market and develop the ability to capture that market, it would give us an advantage we better utilize our facilities. So I, I think about the fixed cost structures, how are we going to maintain some balance in that with margin pressure coming, interest rates rising. I think about the DR tools, how are we going to be able to provide a more contemporary experience to the customer. 
Uh, I think about how to get faster, faster, faster all the time. Because yeah, I think if we're faster, we get more throughput through the stores. I can do it with less people. Um, the people that are there are more efficient. They can make more money. So, I mean, it, it's, it's really those things. You know, what are the fixed cost structures? How are we going to maintain some balance with that? How are we going to continue to develop a modern retailing concept and be able to expand our, our, our reach from our current spot? And, and you know, that's, that's really on our mind often. Yeah, you really spent some time when you went into the, the Southern California market. You, you acquired a few stores on the northern side of the market, and then you went into the southern side of LA, and so you really kind of got it sandwiched, but you're really investing a lot in that market. And then you're right, you know, I've worked with Carl for a number of years, and he's very much about process. Process and efficiency and serving the customer. And so, uh, Paul, you want to jump in and talk, uh, talk about a couple different things you're looking at as you look at the dealership group of the future? Well, first of all, uh, Carl was formerly a, a competitor in Minneapolis, and he was really good, so I'm glad he went to California, so I don't have to worry so much about <laughs> you anymore. But, uh, you know, I, I think the two things that are constantly evolving are uh, customers' expectations and the ability to attract the employees in today's world. And I, I can't imagine that there's a dealer in this room that isn't thinking about at least one of those two things, if not both. Um, it's a very, very different world in terms of trying to attract people into our space and to retain people in our space. Our turnover in this industry is still too high, and there are far too many people that aren't interested uh, versus some of the other options that are out there. And frankly, this, this younger group today, I'm not sure any of us have completely got them figured out yet. Uh, but I think we have to continue to evolve and to be open-minded to uh, what does it take to attract people into this industry and to retain them? And so we put a lot of our energy uh, at Walzer Automotive Group into thinking about uh, what does it take to, uh, to, to bring these folks in? Because you can't do anything if you don't have a team. Uh, and the other aspect of it is, is the customer experience. Uh, last year in my opportunity to, uh, to run our trade association, I really tried to emphasize as I went from state to state the need for us uh, as dealers to, to improve our model. Uh, it, it's no mystery to anybody in here that we're being attacked uh, from new OEMs that are coming in that are not using dealers, uh, from the existing OEMs who are looking to gain more control over the whole process and, and moving into things like the agency model over in Europe that many of you have probably read about. And so we, in order to protect our franchise system, have to perform better because ultimately the customer is going to decide who wins in this game. And so whether that's technology solutions or better processes or attracting better team members, uh, I think that uh, an ongoing need is to continue to evolve. And I agree with Carl on the speed issue. We're not going to survive if it takes four hours to buy a car. So everybody in this industry has to figure out through technology, through processes and things, how do we make that experience 30 minutes or less? And I think if we do that, we can compete effectively going forward. Paul was great when we, uh, when we were talking about uh, the panel and dealership group of the future. He's like, this is perfect for me. I've been studying this for the last four or five years. We could, and with all of the panelists, they could, they could talk for a few days on dealership group of the future and how they're looking at the, looking at the industry and the business. And so, um, Rob, do you, wanna, do you wanna talk about uh, in your market in Pittsburgh, Rob closed on a transaction on Friday, and so he's been busy the last, uh, last week here or so, but uh, talk about how you look at it. You look at the industry and the space and what you're focused on. So I just want to be clear that because of that closing, I was not on the pre-call with these guys, and I mentioned to Paul last night that I'm just going to say whatever Paul said I agree with, so whatever <laughs> Paul said I agree with. Uh, from our standpoint, uh, and much of this is really um, reinforcing what Paul said, I, I, I think it is, we look at how do we deepen the customer engagement? How do we create long-term relationships? How do we make those relationships even more intimate? Um, and so within the confines of our geography, uh, as we fill out the network, because I, I really view it as a network strategy and not just the 
assimilation of these individual boxes, right? It's a network strategy serving a group of customers in a defined geography. How can we do that better? How can we use technology to enhance that through through digital retail, through wherever the wherever the service experience goes to make that more and more convenient for people? Uh, and 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 how do we attract and develop people? We have an advantage in that there is is in, in, in a growing when we're a growing organization in a, in a defined geography there are more areas for them to, to step up into. So we need to leverage that advantage more, invest more resources in the things that the, the workers of today and tomorrow are looking for. And you know, most importantly, how do we get to a point in a defined geography where somebody that's shopping for a Honda or a Toyota or a Ford they're not saying, well, I'm going to buy a Ford and I'm going to look at where the Ford dealers are, but they're going to first look at the, the, the dominant retailer in the geography and say, well, they have what I need, I'm going to go to them. And that's really, the, that's what drives us and that's what drives me. And so when you're, with your latest acquisition, uh, it, was it in the same geography or did you step outside the geography? It was an adjacent geography. and. Um, and there's, you know, there's a lot of people. I, I think, I think how we grow as as retailers really is a function of what's most important to us as entrepreneurs. And there's, I know there's people in my 20 group. There's smart people in this room, and everybody does it. You know, everybody has, doesn't do it the same way, and that's how we learn from each other. Uh, but for us, we we've always, and I've always been more comfortable in a defined geography. One culture, one brand, one, you know, easier to develop and grow people within that space, uh, easier for people to, to know who we are, uh, more efficient to market and advertise, all those, all that, and all those reasons behind it. But we decided, um, you know, we, we made the step to go to Youngstown, uh, 45 minutes away, so it's not that far. Uh, it's easy for easy for us to drive over and get there and we don't need to stay in the hotel and all those efficiencies that, that we get with it so um, and we think there's a little bit more growth there for us as we as we get as we go forward so exciting yeah and when you look at look at what Paul's built in the Minneapolis market and and also in the Wichita market you look at uh, where Rob Rob is in Pittsburgh and what he's built it, it really goes to what Alan was talking about earlier in terms of the in terms of the uh, the scaling within a market, and I think it was Rob that was saying, the ability to move up and down for a consumer, if you want to buy a Ford, if you want to buy an import, a Honda or a Toyota, or if you want to buy Lexus, you can go up and down in the brand in a market, which is really important. And so I think both Paul and Rob have uh, have been able to been able to do that. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we jump into uh, uh, the next topic that I think a lot of you are are thinking about here in, in terms of connecting with Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, and there's probably no better connect. Uh, and I'm the one with the Nikes on. Than, <laughs> than, Paul, than Paul, Daly, Paul Daly here. And in terms of maybe just educate the group as to what you're seeing in terms of the next generation uh, with that, that skill set, you know, and, and, and what they want and what they're looking for and, and kind of what the brand is you know, as, as the dealers have developed a brand in their markets, what does that mean to Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z? So um, I'm 43 years old, so I really straddle Gen X and uh, Gen Y, so millennials. So I, I, I benchmark as a Gen Xer. I really understand Gen Y, and um, my oldest child is 16. So, like, I'm really starting. And my youngest is three, which is Generation Alpha. So I feel like I'm Stretch Armstrong right now going across four generations. And there's a word that, that I'm going to say that I was, I was hearing what Paul was saying when you asked, what is he focusing on? And he said, um, people, hiring, and customer experience. And hearing Alan speak and, and having the opportunity to be invited into a lot of, like many of you, owner's offices and executive rooms, there's a word that I don't hear, but it's the one word that contextualizes all of this as you ask that question, and the word is conviction. And it's not the word that we use a lot in the industry, but I feel like it's something that so many have when it comes to the industry. And I think the next five to eight years is going to be an extreme test of your conviction on whether or not you believe that 
hiring, and customer experience are truly important and truly the things that are going to drive the profits and the acquisition opportunities that we're talking about. That is how everything comes together. Um, Gen X or Gen Y, Gen Z, we have a hiring uh, challenge right now, right? And we're seeing, even we're seeing layoffs, but you know, we don't really see that in automotive because it's a stable business, right? It's a staple business. And I think it's in everyone's mind that there is some group of people we're gonna be able to hire once the hiring pinch goes away. And the truth is, the data tells us that is not going to happen. The birth rate is not where it needs to be to provide us with that influx of people to hire. What that means when it comes to brand and when it comes to customer experience is that the conviction to kind of group it all together as one mentality, especially as small groups are getting larger, the opportunity to consolidate not just operational efficiencies, but Rob, you mentioned this, brand efficiency under one brand, under one uh, you know, employee development program, the necessity for many of you in this room to pay attention more than you've ever paid attention to what is the narrative being spoken about our business is actually what drives the hiring, not more ads on Indeed. And it certainly drives retention. To put attentionality into does my customer experience communicate what kind of place this is to work? And then does my, does my intentionality behind communicating what kind of place this is to work, does that drive and inform my customer experience? They're all one. And back to I think the level of conviction you have to really believe and leverage and lean into that because we have the resources, we have the capabilities in this industry to do it, but it's just not something we're used to doing. So when it comes to courting Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z specifically, I think the conviction to bring those together and understanding that those are actually the drivers of all the stuff that Alan talked about, that, that's going to be what it takes to actually connect. I know that's not tactical, it's more strategic, but the tactics don't matter if the strategy's out of place. You know, and it really feels like with the, with the new generation, kind of what the brand and what the dealership dealer stands for is probably more important than it's ever been. It what very they, much is. The impact they have on the community, Alan touched on that. And you know, we see data, and, and Alan presented some of it, that talks about how many people would buy a car completely online if they could. It said like 96%. How many people in this room believe that 96% of people want to buy a car completely online? Raise your hand. Zero. Zero people believe that. And let me give you a little anecdotal evidence. So whenever we go and produce content and do shows in different towns and, and put on like panel events, we go on the street and we bring a microphone and we're like, random person, let me ask you a question. And the thing is that most people, when they ask that question, they say, hey, if you could buy a car online and never have to go into a dealer and never have to talk to a salesman and everything will work perfectly and it would be like this euphoric experience, would you do it? And people are like, uh, yeah, right? Who would say no? But when we ask the question this way, we say, tell me about the last car you bought, and they'll tell us, and we'll say, where did you buy the car? Most everyone says a local dealer. And we say, what was your favorite part about the process? That's a different approach, right? And every single time, we get a story about the salesperson or something about the pro, like they found the car they wanted or they took care of the feature, and we say, then we ask the question, if you could buy a car completely online, would you do it? And every single person we've asked that question to said no. They said, I'll shop online, but they said, I, I kind of feel like I'm, I'm gonna do better if I talk to somebody. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pivot here a little bit and start talking about branding in the markets, because if you look at the, the dealers uh, with Rob, he's got uh, number one Cochran in the uh, Pittsburgh market. Paul's had the Walzer way in, in that market. Carl developed the Buy Happy. Uh, promise the Buy Happy brand in the Minneapolis market and now has developed the Hello Auto uh, brand in the Southern California market. And it's really, I think the goal with, with it uh, from Carl's perspective on the branding side is really to develop a brand that consumers can connect with like we were talking about. They can, they can feel good about doing business and you try to make it as easy as you can. But as you've built your group in the uh, Southern California market with six stores, You've really, you've really invested heavily in the Hello Auto brand. And so maybe, maybe talk a little bit about that, how you look at it, because his, his approach, he immediately going into the market, 
he started to develop the brand. So maybe talk a little bit about that, uh, Carl. Sure. I think the I've always been an advocate of developing a brand and what, what does that really mean? Everybody says they have a brand. In our world, it's just a set of principles that we live by and work by. It's, you know, it goes back to Paul's point of, you know, we communicate who we are and what we are and how we do things to our employees, which is critical. That allows us to attract people that think like us and come to us. And, you know, I, I, moving across the country to California, I've been humbled by the fact that I've had a, a 10, 12 people follow across the country on the promise. So that tells me it does mean something. You know, our brand has to convey that message of quality and consistency to our employees first, to our customers second, and to our communities third, and we always drive and, and stay true to that. It also gives you a bit of an operating conscience and a roadmap to make your decisions within. If your brand is this, you know, whether it's right, wrong, or indifferent, or whether you agree with the principles of our particular brand, we spend a lot of time developing that brand and communicating that, and it just gives us a guide to behave under. So I, I think in today's world, the consumer more and more, want, they want corporate responsibility. They want to deal with a company that they feel is a good company. And having a brand that says, hey, this is who we are. This is how we do things. When you come into Hello Auto, this is how you'll experience. And keeping that consistency, it, it, just, it just guides all of us through the process. So I think it's a critical uh, a piece. And I think that some of the larger dealer groups have a great opportunity to really get behind their years of history and good practice. And, and spend some time thinking about how they convey their message out to the community because it makes things a lot easier. And for us, we've been able to attract people. There's a broad pool of people to, that, that, that should come into our business. It's, a, it's hard, it's grindy, it's a, you know, but it, it, it requires some intellect. Um, it, certainly, it, that we have a lot of good, high-paying jobs, but we don't seem to attract a broad swath of people. And I think the brand in our world has been a key to be able to bring different kinds of employees to, to market. Our GMs, I have, you know, right now we have six doors, one coming. I have three women. Uh, uh, I have. All, you know, I don't have all of our, uh, our GMs have minority backgrounds, and they're 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 an interesting, diverse group. And I think they come to us because of what they see we are trying to be and aspiring to be. And brand that brand message is, is critical to that point. So and, it, and then it you helps tie, check a lot of the boxes that these gentlemen have talked about. So and then you tie the messaging around that brand to the community, to the customers, to yeah, the all, to the market, and everything you do, social media. Yeah, always we have a strict guideline on how we can speak. And, and how our, all of our print materials are, and it, it all has to follow within a strict guideline, and then you convey consistency, and people, and I think people are drawn to that. The fact that you called it an operational conscience is amazing, yeah. because people think often about brand like it's, it's a design aesthetic, right? Like, yeah, I know I need that stuff, but the true, the true definition, right? Brand just makes someone feel something that moves toward or away from you, so the fact that you treat it as an operational conscience is, is why it's been effective, why it was effective at Maury's, yeah. why it's effective here. Yeah, the design aesthetic is an element of it, but the, the broader message is, hey, you want people to, f the people that work with us, we want them to feel a certain way. And if they feel that way, they convey that message to the customer. We spend as much time communicating what we do in our branding and our, our marketing internally as we do externally, because it's our people that will convey that experience to the customer. If they believe it and they live it, the customer feels it, and that's how, you know. I think Toyota and some of the communications, you know, in partnering with Paul initially and seeing some of the Toyota communications, there's a, a person at Toyota that I was on her bottom of her messaging. She says, hey, my employees are never, my customers are never going to be happier than, than, my, than our employees. Mm -hmm. So we really start there to make sure that, you know, and we do some different things within our brand. We're closed on Sundays in California, which some people think is ridiculous. We have, you know, we're starting to offer four-day work weeks for our salespeople. We, we just do different things um, to be able to attract people that will support our brand and they convey that message out to the customer. And, and more and more we're seeing it in comments from customers when they're buying cars, parts, and service from us. So. Yeah, that connectivity is important. And I think, I think, Rob, when you were talking about or preparing just the, the idea behind the One Cochran brand and the, it, within the geography and the things that it does and the things that it communicates, somewhat similar to what Carl was saying, but you were... I think you're, you're ahead of where he's at in terms of the branding process, but maybe talk a little bit about, on the brand side, kind of some of the things that you've seen. Well, in a, in a market, in a western Pennsylvania market where there's not uh, as much transience as there would be in other parts of the country, uh, 
it's it's a generational it's a really a generational thing where we're we're selling vehicles to people uh children and grandchildren of people that my father would have sold vehicles to um we take that very seriously and um you know, so the, you know, just what was commented on the ethos of the organization. How effectively do we convey that? Uh, tra you know, as we as we look at the last ten years, transparency, um, personal, hopefully conveying some humility, uh, progressive yeah, that we're, we're, we're with our with our digital platform or expressway. Uh, that we're we're focused on the future, and, and if those those that want to those that want to uh, do more online or even all of it online, we're we're here for you. And any product that you want, basically within the mass market, we can provide. Uh, but all around a personal, transparent, uh, foundational experience that has been in the market for many, many, many years. Brand is very, very important to us. It has served us well. Um, it's, there's also a risk with it, right? We, you know, and there's, because of that, that we, you, you, we, if there's a rogue salesperson that doesn't do something right in a showroom, we have to have our management, uh, we, we have to have our management and our, and our antenna up to not allow any behavior that can erode the brand. Uh, so when you, when you adopt a real focus on brand, there's, there's a lot of investment that goes with that to protect that brand, to protect the shield, if you will. Um, and my, you know, the last comment I'll make, because some of our people are with me, um, the, the woman that is our really head of the marketing, you know, a few years ago, I said, what, what do you want your title to be? It wasn't marketing, you know, it was, it was chief brand officer. So that, that, that speaks again about some of the ethos within our company. You know, when you look at brand, you, there's external facing brand in terms of the market and what it means as a customer to do business with any of the dealers. And then internally, the other thing you talked about, Rob, too, was, was with your people. It gives them more opportunities. It gives them an opportunity to grow with the company, different positions, different opportunities, different stores, which is really important, which kind of ties in on the internal side, creating opportunities for your people and allowing them to grow with the company, too. Yes, and knowing what the company's about, right? And that was spoken about as well. I think as, as we're looking to attract team members, we're looking to attract younger people coming into the workforce, so much of it is them buying into what you are about and what you support. And if all you're about is going out and trying to make money, I, I think you're going to have a hard time connecting with a lot of the people coming into the workforce. You know, we'll switch, switch gears here a little bit and, and talk about process, because I think the other thing you think about is all the dealers are looking into the future and, and being competitive in the future, talking about process, talking about speed, talking about efficiency. You know, and I think, uh, Paul, you were one of the first adopters of the one price strategy in terms, of, in terms of doing business with the customer, transparency. I know, Rob, you talked a little bit about transparency. But then also, Paul, you've, you've added on one point of contact in terms of if I'm coming into your store, it's one price, it's transparent, and I'm, and I'm going to be uh, working with one person throughout the entire transaction, and so, which I think is, is really moving the ball forward down the field in terms of that interaction and that relationship with the customer. But maybe talk a little bit about that, what you went through and how you look at it, because I think it's, it's definitely the way of the future. Well, I think one of the things is going back to the branding question is we made the mistake of branding before we had a reason to brand. So uh, somewhere along the line, I don't remember what year it was, we took the number of stores we had. I think it was maybe five or six at the time. This is many, many years ago. And we decided to put the name on all the stores, but we didn't really stand for anything. So, you know, I remember going to a grocery store and handing out my credit card to pay for my groceries and being nervous when the person said, oh, I recently bought a car from you. So I'd be like, okay, I wonder if this is going to be a good story or a bad, bad story. Yeah. But so I think what, what we ultimately concluded was that if we're going to have a brand that we needed to stand for something that was 
that was different, that we could kind of hang our hat on, our team members could hang our hat on, the customers could have an expectation when they came to see us. So I think branding and, and being a differentiator kind of go hand in hand. Uh, we made the decision to, uh, to go to one price selling in part to avoid the grocery store conversations that we were having because we did feel like it was a better experience for the customers and then ultimately transitioned into the single point of contact uh, probably about 10 years later. Um, what I've learned from those experiences is this. Uh, everybody in this room has been involved in changing processes uh, and process change can be relatively easy. Uh, but when you combine that with a cultural change, which is what those two things are, when you're changing sort of the, way, the whole way you think about the customer experience and, and it really involves dramatic change, um, that's a much more challenging journey. And it's generally one that uh, there are some points in the time uh, that this is being done where, you're, where it's painful, uh, where you actually get to a point where you go, I mean, this, does this really make any sense? Should we really do this? And so you really have to kind of stick it out and wait till it actually starts to do the very thing that you thought it was going to do. So you, you have to believe it. You got to get your team members to believe it. And you have to be willing to accept a little bit of a pain, maybe take a step backwards before you can take two steps forward. Um, those have been important uh, journeys for us and uh, certainly define a lot about who we are today. Um, I don't think... Most customers want to negotiate. Uh, I don't think most customers want to be transferred from one team member to the next. And so if you're truly designing your business around what the customer wants to experience, then I think you have to take a real hard look at some of the ways that traditional dealership processes work. Uh, and to be honest with you, from a standpoint of recruiting, uh, I think it's kind of in the sweet spot of maybe what the future employees are looking for. I don't know a lot of people who aspire to go negotiate as their career. Um, certainly the idea, if you go out today to colleges and you say, I got a swell idea for you, I want you to come to work for us. You're gonna negotiate these transactions. I want you to work evenings and Saturdays and be paid on straight commission. Uh, I don't think we'd get a lot of people calling us on the phone, so we have to have ways to evolve to attract these people that uh, are willing to come in and be excited about something very, very different. You know, and when you look at the process and the interaction with customers, it feels like every time I talk to you, you're looking at it from the customer's perspective. What's right for them in, in terms of buying, interacting with, with your dealerships and your group, continuously saying what makes it easier for them, what's better for how do, I, uh, how do I make the process uh, simpler, faster, more efficient, because we just don't have time? So every, it seems like everything you do, looking into the future, everything you do is around that concept. I hear Rob and Carl talking about that too, where what's right for the customer and how do we make it easy for them? Well, I, I think everybody in this room thinks that way, Scott. I mean, you, you, you have to be thinking about the customer. And I'm not an advocate that says that everybody in the world should operate under one price or single point of contact. Those were just solutions that uh, we felt were, you know, a good fit for us and where we wanted to go. But there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. I, but I think if you're not thinking about the customer experience and improving and you're not thinking about how to attract team members, you're not going to be around much longer. You know, there's a question that came in. Uh, can the panelists share what their annual employee turnover is on a percentage basis, roughly? Carl? Yeah, we just, we just uh, looked at our 2022 turnover. Overall was 38%. We opened two new stores, one in February, one in July. So that was a contributing factor. Um, I, I think 12 or 13% of that turnover was transfers from store to store. So we, we look at that as a total turnover number. So, you know, I, I think... That, that, that was where we were, 38% overall, 26 or 27% true turnover. Yeah. Within the group. Within uh, the group. Paul, how about you? Uh, we, had a, we had a bad year last year for turnover, and I don't know, uh, you know, I think part of what happened with us, to be honest with you, is that um, when the margins got so much better on the cars, we, we don't pay a percentage of the, of the profit uh, as part of our commission plan. Uh, our salespeople are salaried, 
uh, with some bonuses and it doesn't make any difference what car they sell or how much we make on it. And so we did have some team members leave last year because they felt like there was a better opportunity to go to a store where they could participate in the higher margins. So we bounced up to 39%, which is the highest we've been in a long time. Uh, we did have a lot of turnover uh, on the entry level jobs as well. So those were the two spots where we kind of got hurt, uh, lost some salespeople, and um, had a, just a tremendous amount of turnover on the, you know, the runners and the and the lube techs and those types of entry level roles that, uh, I, you know, it's just harder to hang on to those people. So, Rob, how about you? Uh, we were in the high 20s last year and. We work hard to try to get into the low 20s, but that's elusive. It seems like it always ends up in the high 20s. So uh, nothing jumps out other than we need to continue focusing on culture and bring in the right people. And and from a a team member standpoint, we uh, we do focus on measuring engagement, highly engaged, somewhat engaged, neither engaged nor disengaged. And... We know that when we have more people that are highly engaged, it's a it's a good thing. And so, uh, how do we get how do we get those people? And a lot of it is management training, uh, and and managers actually engaging with the team members and not just focused on the tasks of the day. And I think that is an evolution for this industry. I, I think historically that's not what we've been focused on. Can I add about turnover? I think um, I just read a, a study that says. Um, Automotive had a a lower than usual turnover in the last two years, coming in right around 35%. Um, Some of the reasons being that folks going to uh, sales folks, having a great opportunity when they're paid on, you know, the margins and things like that to just make a lot of money and, let's be honest, not have to do a lot for it, right? It was like fish just jumping into the boat over the last two years. And it'll be interesting to see what happens because I've literally gotten some calls from some clients saying, my, a salesperson just came into my office and they've been with me for two years and they didn't know what to do when the, per, when the buyer said, I have to ask my spouse. That's a real conversation. What do I do? So I think that what's going to happen um, without a renewed focus on culture, um, that turnover number could get really bad really fast um, because of those factors, especially in the sales side of the business, which historically has been closer to 50%. So, just a little texture the, the, to that. The latest NEDA comp study, comp went up from 21 to 22, or from 20 to 21, 48% on average across all dealership positions. The average salesperson made 118 grand a year average. So, people aren't moving when they're making that much money. Yeah, so Paul actually got the, bet, the short end of that stick because you're playing the long game with the sales model, right? So, your turnover went up a little bit because people... People went, and also I'll say to the to the entry level positions, um, that's not unique to automotive. We study all types of retail, and um, I, how, how many people in here actually have done hiring for their store, or know what's going on with hiring? I mean, not showing up for interviews, accepting a job, and not showing up for the first day, right? Is five years ago was relatively unheard of, just five years ago, and that has actually become part of the culture. So. Um, even leaning back into the intentionality of it, um, it's just going to be that much more uh, important that we have that conviction that we really care about that, so. You know, we'll pivot a little bit here uh, in the looking at the world of technology and and kind of where we're going. I think all of the dealers have really spent a lot of money as you've transitioned to a more digital uh, retail platform, you know, going down the road of potentially being virtual. I mean, I could see where some of the dealers in different markets end up, end up developing a virtual platform where consumers can interact with the dealer. Uh, but with all the different technologies that, that are coming at dealers and, and the things that you're having to deal with, maybe Paul, talk a little bit about what you're seeing on the technologies and, uh, and what dealers should be thinking about or what you, at a macro level what you're seeing. Uh, when it comes to technology, a lot of conversation around uh, on the marketing side, around uh, CDPs or consumer data platforms. Technology is just increasing in velocity across, across, the, across the world, honestly. And automotive is now 
toward the front of that curve when typically we had a little bit of ability to kind of drag the curve, but that's not the case anymore. And uh, you mentioned chat GPT. Um, how many people know what that is? All right, so we're probably at like 30%. It's an AI language generator. Well, basically, you should look it up, chat GPT. You can try it for free and use it for free. It's in beta. And you can ask it questions. You can have it develop. You could have it write a whole paper for you. You could say, um, give me five ways to relieve neck strain at work. It's basically like Google in plain language, but it can actually synthesize content. You could write job ads with it. And what it's actually doing is going to disrupt the entire communication system we're in. Whether that's education, whether that's marketing, whether that's um, operations and training, ChatGPT is gonna change that. But what it basically does though, it's an order taker. Just similar to Google, except it puts it in plain language. Actually, Google is very on its heels about it because now you can get search results from ChatGPT, which you know scours it, it was basically trained in 2001, so it doesn't have anything after 2001, but it scours everything written or created, and then it gives you the best what it thinks result. How that translates into technology and back to the hiring and recruiting and operations is that you have the opportunity to leverage the new technology to focus on the human elements of the business as opposed to having to do all the technical heavy lifting or job description heavy lifting or operational heavy lifting. Instead, you can focus on what the people actually want. Because you can't just, people still need a translator. We still need to translate it and connect it in human terms. So as all of that happens in our world, how it boils down to the hiring issue and to the customer experience issue is that people expect it to be more frictionless. And uh, we just reported on a story about um, Pepsi and they were talking about how they deploy technology in their warehouse to keep employees. And you would think, well, Pepsi warehouse is pretty cut and dry. But they focused on how can we actually make things smoother for our employees to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so as you think about your operational process, the people you're hiring get really frustrated when the technology is broken. They get really frustrated when the process doesn't make sense. And then they look for another job. So it's just as important on the inside as the outside, but the velocity is picking up quite a bit. Yeah, and tie, tying the technology to the people. And the, the other thing you realize is with people today, technology-wise, they're a lot more savvy than any of us are. They're a lot more open to using technology. I mean, my kids, I, I, they have all kinds of things on their phones and, you know, the connectivity of Snap and, you know, the different Instagram, different things they're using, they're way ahead of us. Uh, but just to touch on the one comment Paul made about ChatGPT, Every one of you in the room should be studying this because it, it's coming uh, full speed and it's going to change the business from that perspective. I had one of our partners come up to me this last week and he said, here, let me show you this. It was ChatGPT. It was Genie IA, I think was the, was the app. And he said, he asked the app, he said, uh, write a synopsis or write a blog for me on a healthcare conference that just took place in North Carolina. On his phone, it popped up, three paragraphs. He said... Tell me, or give me a title for that blog post, and it, and it sent it to him. And so it, you, harnessing that power and that capability, I mean, with technology and with, within the, you know, that space as to what's coming, I think is going to be really important. You can, um, actually, you can actually drop the entire transcript of this, of this event today. We could drop, if we had a transcript, we could drop the whole thing in there, and it would be tens of thousands of words, and you could tell it to write me a 500-word summary on what was discussed and what best practices we should employ moving forward, and it would. And it, and it would do it like in five seconds, yeah. right? You know, and so the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about on technology or talk to the panel here is, I know, Carl, you'd brought up just the idea of the, one of the challenges that dealers have internally is really the connectivity of the data between systems, you know, and internally in the, in the dealership and trying to get it out, trying to utilize it, and, and so maybe spend a little time talking about that there, Carl, in terms of how you see that and how you're working with that. Because I, I think there's some competitors, maybe like Tesla or some of the other ones, where their data is a lot easier to get. Yeah, I think when we look at 
the data specifically, Scott, and how, I mean, everybody knows as a dealer, you're, you're you know, reduced to a few basic DMS systems that you have to use, and yeah, there's drifting towards open architecture and this and that. You know, one of our brands just came to us recently with a data sharing agreement, and their, you know, dealers have, you know, my, my initial reaction is to resist, you know, data sharing back and forth. But it, when you look at some of the competitors that are out there, all the new EV companies, they have a huge advantage in data sharing over where we have. Their cars are communicating differently. Their, you know, Tesla's insurance product is, is the cheapest in the industry, and they do that because they have a better pool of data. So it, it's, you know, I, I think that's something that we, we, you know, I don't know where to go with that yet, but it, it's, that's another thing that's coming on the horizon. And, and, it was something that we have to think about. If we can get better and more sophisticated at knowing where our customers are, what they do, what their habits are, and get really more granular with it, 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 it drives marketing costs down and makes it easier to find people, and, and it, just, it will be better all the way around. Your point on technology with Paul, one of the things that, you know, Paul's a pretty humble guy, one of the things that when you're know, having a one price, one point of contact and using the technology that they use and being cognizant of the fact that a lot of the technology is really sexy and it looks kind of cool, but if it doesn't make the experience faster for your employees or better for the customer, it's really just a sexy new kind of looking thing. In their organization, they, they have, you know, they develop their own uh, software that they're using and uh, it, it makes the pr their process a lot more efficient. And whether you want to go one price, one point of contact or not is irrelevant. In their world, it's faster and they are a lot faster. And they have some things that within their organization that I've never heard of anywhere at any other dealer group in the country. Paul's got a salesperson that's so sold over 900 cars last year, signed all of them out himself individually with a 60-some percent VSC pen. He's got 15 people that sell over 450 cars a year. And what that allows him to do organizationally is he gets so much more throughput through his sales team that he can take his drive his cost per transaction down because he can pay a salesperson less per car because they can, where you, you can, your salespeople can average 12 or 15, his can average 25. So there, there's an advantage all the way around in his system and his approach, but it's a really holistic look at, hey, how am I going to use the technology? How's it going to serve the customer? How's it going to serve my employee? And how's it going to serve the business in terms of profitability? And he's, he's solved the riddle where I don't know that anybody else has in the way that they've done it. So it's pretty impressive. You got a salesperson that sells 90 some cars three months in a row. It's just freaking unbelievable. You, know, it's, you can't even believe it. I'm going to have Carl talk to all the manufacturers on my behalf. And, and, see if I and we're just trying to copy some of that. So, yeah. But he's ahead. Yeah. You know, one of the areas, we'll, we'll transition here a little bit, uh, the, the factory dealer relations. You know, it, it, it's kind of uh, went in a few different directions over the course of the last 10, 15 years. It feels like, when, like Paul, when I, when I see how you how you operated as chair of NADA and how you operate your group. You know, I, I think historically, maybe it was a little more challenging relationship you had with the manufacturers, but today, the last 10, 15 years, I think your approach has, has changed. Really looking at the manufacturers as a partner. You know, you don't always align, you don't always have the, the same interests, the same decision making, but I think you've really transitioned your business and I see it with Rob and Carl, is really looking at more uh, the partnership with the manufacturers uh, in, in the process and how you work with them. And so maybe, I know you talked a little bit about that or you worked with it at, as the chair of NADA, but maybe talk a little bit about that as you look at that going forward. Well, I, I, I know both of the other, my co-panelists here, and I think we are all uh, passionately in agreement because, um, uh, I, well, I, I just know their successes in getting open points, uh, which is something that, that we have done a fair amount of ourselves. Uh, I learned this from the hard way. My dad was a, a dealer, and, and uh, he only grew to a couple of stores uh, in his time, uh, but he ended up in lawsuits with both of the OEMs that he represented. And, and I would suggest to you, looking back on those, he was correct both times. In other words, he had a valid point. Uh, he was upset, he had a right to be, uh, and so he pursued it in the courts. And he won the battles, uh, but he lost the war because, as most of you know, when you buy a new store or apply for an open point, one of the questions the OEMs are interested in is, have you ever been in a lawsuit with another manufacturer? And if the answer to that is yes, your conversation's going to be very short. Um, 
OEMs uh, and dealers have areas of conflict, and um, our agendas aren't always perfectly aligned. But I have found, as I know that the same for Rob and for Carl, is that it's sometimes I think it's just smarter to take the hit a little bit, you know, take those extra cars that you don't really want, um, write off those warranty claims that you really don't think you should be writing off and go along with some of their silly facility initiatives and some of the things they do. Because in the long run, you're just going to be miles and miles ahead. And so I, I, I get upset sometimes about some of the behaviors. And uh, but honestly, I'm not saying we should lay down for everything. We should, we should speak with a collective voice and stand up for the things that we believe in. But um, I feel like diplomacy and, and constructive dialogue is a far better path than the one that my dad chose. And, and uh, so of our uh, you know, 35 stores, 10 of them have been open points. And so that's, you know, that's, uh, that's a lot of free stuff. You know, I was listening to Alan earlier talking about the price of entry to buy these stores these days. And so when I think about the value of the 10 stores, boy, that's an awful lot of extra money that I could write aside by saying I took, you know, six of these cars that didn't sell or whatever just to make them happy. So I don't know. I, I'm more of a guy that says, Let, let's see if we can have a constructive partnership. I'm going to take a hit from time to time. Uh, but in the long run, I think I'm going to be better off. And, and that was part of my message last year with NADA is I, I do think we've got to work in partnership with the manufacturers to improve the customer experience because it takes both parties to really make that happen. If the OEMs have complex programs uh, that really make the process confusing and, and maybe like things like the stair steps that were going on for a while, uh, that thankfully the you know pandemic has at least temporarily uh, gotten rid of. I, I think those are really destructive to the customer experience. They don't uh, make us look very credible, uh, and ultimately that's damaging to the franchise system that is under attack right now by by new players. So, and that's that's really what you stressed over the course of the last year: the franchise system being under attack with the direct selling that model, the the uh, just the process in terms of the. In the business that 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 is is an issue for dealers to and to try to get it right is important. You know, there's a question that came in uh, around this issue of dealer manufacturer relationships. And Rob, maybe I'll, I'll I'll give you this question here: What are one or two manufacturers that really get the partnership with dealers and do it well? And maybe maybe one or two that could really improve or could maybe do it better. Well, well first of all. Uh I can, not to not to just keep saying the same thing. I completely agree um, everything with what Paul just said, just based on my experience. And you know, I started in this industry as a as a younger guy, uh, and a younger guy. My father had passed away prematurely, and the the OEMs, you know, they 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 could have dealt with me in a variety of ways, but. From my standpoint, getting to know them, engaging with them, creating relationships, people help me more than they needed to help me. Um, and I think I think it's easy in this industry to to say, well, these guys are out to you know put the screws to you and this. But my you know, not, not that we've not had issues where we've gotten frustrated. But my personal my personal experience is when I get to know and have a connection and engagement with people that it, you know, more times than not, it has worked out in my favor versus against me. Um, there's a guy out here, Mark Lenave, uh, who, you know, who, with his experience with GM and with Ford, he helped me. You know, there, there were times that they did more than they needed to do. So from, a, from an OEM standpoint, it's pretty clear you can look at the, the NADA surveys and the dealer attitude surveys. Toyota and Lexus are always one and two. There's a reason they're one and two is that they're 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 the most in, they most enthusiastically embrace the franchise system. Uh, when the questions come in on agency model and will we ever consider this, in, with most of the with many of the manufacturers, there's kind of a positioning. Oh, we're not going. We don't do that. But with with Toyota and Lexus, it's this 
hell no, we're not going to do that. And so the, the dealers get that, feel that, trust that. When there's trust between dealer and OEM, that's a good thing. Um, the others, I'm, you know, there's, an, there's any number of ones that can improve, and some are trying to improve and have gotten better, certainly in the environment that we've come through. Um, but it's, it's hard to improve in, in six or 12 month increments. It's a long term relationship. So it, it really, at least from my standpoint, it, it, it has to be played out over three, four, five years before I think you see uh, material changes in some of the survey results. Any, anything to add uh, on that, Paul or Carl? In terms of the working with the manufacturers, I think you do see with Toyota and Lexus, Subaru at some level, they really get it. Yeah, from from you know, we treasure our manufacturer relationships. We've had some good partners. Again, I grew up. You know, my dad was a dairy farmer. I didn't have any money when I started doing this, so I really had to depend on my manufacturer relationships to help and support over time. And again, like Paul, that doesn't mean you lay down for everything, but you just have to have some empathy and understand, have some real dialogue, and push where you need to push, and give where you can give. And in the end, it, it seems to work. I mean, we've you know I've been the good fortune with you know, Subaru. I love. I like. I can talk to any through the system they're all consistent with their answers and you know to me that's a sign of a good company I've done well with Mazda over the years and I know it's a Mazda's is still a bit of a small upstart brand for a lot of people but we've done very well with it and through my Mazda relationships that spawned a lot of the growth that I've had over the years you know we've had some challenging relationships with a couple other brands but you know it's that that's you know I've made my mistakes on that side as well in terms of managing that relationship you know Kia for us we have Kia and they've been great to us and you know they they've really tried hard to, and they're focused on success, they're just intensely driven towards being an excellent company, and I think they have a bright future ahead of them, and you know, there, there's a lot of great brands. In, in my world, being small and trying to grow a business, I, yeah, certainly I love Toyota and BMW and Mercedes and Lexus, but to go in the Southern California market and pay a multiple for a Toyota store is not really within my realm of possibility. So, you know, we try to, to, to work with some of the brands that work with us and, and grow organically, and it, it works really well to be able to do that. Yeah, and the, one thing, the one thing I'd say with Carl, having worked with him over a number of years, is he did a really good job uh, working with uh, the brands, with the manufacturers, and get, developing relationships with those, those uh, manufacturers. And the connectivity, you know, Mazda was, was one of his primary brands getting into the business and growing in the business. But what you find is a lot of the executives from Mazda will go to other uh, car makers. And so they may end up at Honda, they may end up at Toyota, they may end up at Subaru. And so that the way you treat the executives and your people that you connect with, the involvement that you have, all have as part of NADA, as part of your manufacturers and dealer boards, I mean, I think that's all part of long term being successful in this business. I think um, you, there was a question earlier that ties into this as well about uh, somebody made the, the comment question um, that popped up that about going back to brand and wouldn't it be great if, if brand were the same internally, externally, and in the community? And to me, that's kind of the point, and that's why we start internally with brand to be able to said, hey, these are our values that we live by, and that gets communicated to our customers, to the community, and to the manufacturer partners, and if you can build yourself as an attractive brand to manufacturers, you will get opportunities, great opportunities that others don't. Like I said, we, you know, I've had good partners in, in Paul and the investor group that I'm with, but the manufacturers have helped us a lot as well. Out of our seven stores, you know, six of them are open points or deals that were brought to us on a rofer, and I wouldn't have had that opportunity if we didn't have great partnerships with the manufacturers. And, and Brand is a, a big piece of that. And at some level, they're seeking you out because of your brand and what it means in the market and how it, how it connects with consumers. Scott, can I type 15? I know we're out of time. Yep. 15 seconds. To, to tether this little, this little thread back to the consumer and thinking about how the OEM is perceiving your brand and your group of stores, so many times when you ask someone where they, who they bought their car from, they're going to give you the OEM name. Right, I bought it from I bought it from Ford. It's got a big Ford sign out front. That's who I bought it from. And so when the OEM is considering these things, they are placing their reputation in the dealer's hands every single day. And so to just be a little empathetic toward that, you realize it's got to be more unified than ever. And then to build your dealer group's brand strong, so the OEM says, "Oh, they understand brand. 
they value brand is, is one of the components to especially like open points. It doesn't surprise me that they like you. <laughs> so I just want to tie that back to like what they're thinking when it comes to consumer mindset and customer experience. Yeah, uh, how about a round of applause for our panelists? Great. Really, really great job, all of them. The, just the depth of experience they have and what they've done is in, in the industry is unbelievable. But we're gonna take a uh, half hour break. And, uh, and so remember to fill out the surveys on your tables and then also, if you wanna get a copy of that Auto Team America white paper on the future of automotive retailing, I think it's the third iteration that we're on that. So uh, look for that too. I think there's hard copies in the back, but thank you. <laughs>